Um, and we're really happy to hang out with everyone today. And we're going to be a little bit more kind of conversational. Um, uh, you, you just see the small pictures of Steve and I right now. So I'll put up a, a larger picture of the two of us. Our in-person workshops are always a black tie affair. So this is the last time we gave a presentation <laughs> uh, thing. So you guys should all be very happy that you don't need to get gussied up for this. We also wanted to just acknowledge the, uh, the generous support of the CTSA award to Duke that has supported us over the years in developing uh, faculty education talks. So, um, you know, we've given workshops for quite a while on, on doing uh, scientific presentations. And that's what we're going to focus on today are giving scientific presentations. And, uh, and in the past, we've always been preparing people to present in person, standing up in front of a live audience, when people can see you. And uh, hopefully you've got some some good slides as visual supports there. But as we all know, th some things have changed dramatically. And now this is what the audience looks like. Everyone's in their own homes. They're watching a, a screen, maybe even a small screen. And it's really changed the rules for how, how to do an effective presentation. And um, Steve, I didn't tell you this, but last night at dinner, my 19-year-old son, James, uh, who knows Steve, uh, was asking about today. And I said, well, we're going to talk a bit about uh, presenting science in a virtual environment. And he said, well, what do you and Steve know about that? <laughs> so there's our vote of confidence from James displaying the usual reverence and respect I've come to expect from him. Um, and, you know, all of us are still learning our way about how to do this effectively. And I think some of the things we're going to share with you today are um, lessons gleaned from years of being on uh, WebEx um, webinars uh, for, for research, for doing uh, distance education. But we're really looking forward to the questions uh, and discussion too, to hear what other observations people have had, because we're, we're all still trying to learn this at the same time here. And so we're gonna go over four different sections here. First, deciding your scientific story, creating effective slides, we're going to talk specifically about how to present data effectively, and then uh, some various topics regarding how you actually give the presentation. So let's start with deciding on your scientific story. And I've got to say that, you know, Steve and I do um, presentation consulting around the university sometimes, and people have got some big grand rounds, they're going to go give it another institution. Um, they or their mentor might, might ask to spend some time with us. And, and Steve and I have found that about 80% of the time we spend with people is on this first section, trying to figure out their scientific story, trying to figure out what, they're, what they can and should be saying to the people. It's not about formatting slides and things. And so um, we found that there are three really important questions to ask when you're starting to do a presentation. The first is, who's my audience? What's their level of sophistication, their education, uh, their motivations, right? Second, how much time do I have for my talk? And with these two pieces of information, then I ask myself, realistically, where can I bring this audience by the end of the talk? And this is an important concept because we would like to transform the audience. We would like to, we'd like to have them leave that talk knowing something or thinking about something differently than they did before. And so I've got to ask, realistically, what can I do? What's possible given who they are and how much time they've given me? And so another way of asking that is, you know, what are those one, three, five, or however many key takeaways for the audience? And that's a different way of thinking than saying, I'm going to sit down and write up my study as a manuscript, right? Where there's certain things I have to include in that. We have to put that to the side and we've got to say, all right, I've got 15 minutes or I've got 45 minutes or seven minutes at some clinical conferences. What realistically can I tell people so that when they leave that talk, they're thinking about that important message. They're talking to other people about that message. That's going to be the sign of a successful talk. And so we want to spend a lot of time trying to figure out what are those key messages that I want people to leave with? 
And once I've got each of those messages identified, now I've got to figure out what of all the great work I've done do I need to be citing in order to bring people to that understanding, that message. And we know that uh, we've heard people giving a talk and they're sort of meandering. There's a lot of methodological detail for this part, but not, they've just glanced over this part and then they've gone off over here. And it's very tiring because you're not sure which, which things you're supposed to be latching onto. Right? It seems like there's some extraneous detail. You're not sure what to do with some of the information. We don't want that reaction. So we want to include only what's needed to make the key points. And uh, this is painful. It's painful for me as a researcher because we spend months trying to make decisions about key design features of our studies and doing all these sensitivity analyses. We do a lot of stuff, a lot of good thinking. And now if I've got 15 minutes, it's hard to leave some of that out, right? It's also hard because I may have been trained to be defensive and I should just be throwing results at people uh, so that it addresses any concerns someone might have. But the problem is those, those end up being the kind of talks where people walk away and they don't have a clear message in mind. They, they've not been transformed in any way. So we wanna just include only what's needed to make the key points. And if people have questions about other aspects of it, they'll ask you. But the key thing is to get the message there and get them excited about it. And so now we have identified sort of what to include in the story. Steve's gonna say a little bit about where to develop your story. Right, so a very practical question to ask at this point, given what Kevin has just said is, like, where, where do we actually develop this story that he's talking about? And obviously there are lots of choices, but we wanna talk about three, three, that, uh, three common ones. And the first is we can just start with a blank page. We can open up our favorite word processing application and just start jotting down ideas. And we wanna focus on the flow of the story, not get distracted in the details, but just figure out what are the main elements of the, of the primary narrative that we want to share with the audience. Now, a second approach that Kevin and I like a lot is we like kind of these visual uh, tools, mind maps, and they're they're pretty much, they're all over the internet now, they're websites with these. And, and what we like about this is this visual approach to developing your story helps you kind of keep the story balanced and you can see if, you know, a certain part of the story is getting disproportionate attention, right? And too much is going on. Now, the the default for, I think, most of us right and also probably carries the highest risk is to just open up whatever presentation software you're going to use whether it's powerpoint or keynote right and just start creating slides you have a, a vague notion of what you're going to talk about but you before you've really refined your story you start focusing on slide development and fonts and images and um, you know, one, one point that we like to remind people is that the story should drive creation of your slides. The slides should not be driving creation of your story. And so um, this is a question. So before we go any farther and talk about creating slides, let's answer a question that we get asked all the time. How many slides should I have for my presentation? And what we would submit is that um, this is the wrong question to be asking in uh, giving a presentation, right? And the, and the reason is, is what we should really be focusing on is what story can I tell effectively within the allotted time I have and what visual supports are needed to help me tell that story? Let's talk about creating uh, effective slides. And, you know, our current circumstances are somewhat different than the challenges we faced in the past when we basically got on planes and went to meetings and were in the room with the people. And so, you know, uh, the focus in the past, I think, of our, um, our presentations were on kind of challenging projection situations for in-person talks like this. Uh, or right in or like this 
the next one, right? So these are really, I'm sure everyone's familiar with these kinds of uh, venues where they're really not designed for a conference, but that's where we all hold conferences. And so a lot of what we talked about in the past was for kind of how to, how to, how to handle these challenging situations. And, and things are a little bit different now, right? So what is the most challenging situation now? Um, it may be something like this, right? That somebody, everybody can see the screen, but some people may be watching the meeting on a small screen. Uh, and so it's a different different set of challenges. I think there are some uh, similarities, but we don't we don't have bad lighting situations in terms of people being able to see what we're projecting anymore. And so, um, so we have a couple of, of points we'd like to uh, talk about. So we have four key tips and then a bonus tip. And so the very first point there, every pixel counts. This is um, a slogan from someone that Kevin and I uh, both really admire. And um, his name is Edward Tufte and he is a recognized expert in uh, data visualization. And one of the, a, kind of a, a paraphrase of one of his points is that every pixel requires cognitive effort to process. And as a result, that every pixel on the slide should be helpful for understanding, right? That, um, that you really want to be kind of disciplined in your approach to adding visual elements to the slides uh, because of this cognitive load that you're putting on people. And it turns out that one of the worst culprits for adding extra pixels to our slides are like default slide templates in PowerPoint and Keynote, right? It's really easy to, to grab one of these, but they're really kind of dangerous in terms of adding extra, um, extra pixels to our presentations, right? And so this can distract from the story. And so here's, here's one example. This is one of our, uh, our favorites is, right, this, this kind of healthcare theme maybe that somebody might use with these x-ray images on the left that are taking up kind of valuable real estate and you know as as you progress through this presentation people might be distracted by looking to see if like a spot is appearing on one of the x-rays or if there's any information about your talk in these images the other aspect that they've added to this default template are these kind of 3d bars for what essentially is a two-dimensional display which Right, there's just no reason to add extra dimensionality and extra cognitive burden to a display like this. Um, and so one uh, thing to keep in mind as you're working with slides is be careful and very deliberate when using templates that you're not adding extra cognitive burden to your slides through these very colorful uh, slide templates that are maybe adding irrelevant information to your presentation. And another thing that we can do to try to reduce the degree of extraneous pixels on the screen is to reduce the words we have on the screen. And, you know, we've all seen those slides where there are all these sentences. And what happens is we start reading those and the person speaking to us. And so now we're doing two things at once. And, and if you're like me, I tend to just read ahead and see if it's interesting. And then I tune out slightly until the slide shifts, right? And so we want to avoid that. And so whenever we are going to have words on the screen, it's good to have a look at them and, and see, are there, is there anything here I can remove, keeping in mind that the words on the screen are accompanying my speaking. And so there doesn't need to be a transcript of what I'm saying. They just need to support what I'm saying. So I could go through each of these sentences and take out some some words that aren't really contributing anything. And, and these statements here would do just fine if, if I was going along explaining these things to reminding people what I'm saying. And now I've, I've freed up a little bit of space and we know that multimodal processing is, is useful. And so I might have a graphic there to underscore that these are, are challenges. And then as I'm explaining, I might add these with builds to correspond to what I'm saying, All right? It's a much cleaner, uh, more humane slide. 
another thing that we can do to try to make more effective slides uh, is to, we're gonna just call that keep it moving. And so let's have a look. This was, this was the situation we used to prepare people for. And we used to say, that, you know, the main connection should be between you, the speaker and the audience with the slides as, as a support. And we even said sometimes, boy, don't put a slide up there sometimes. Think whether you really need a slide. Well, that was, that was for face-to-face -face presentations. Now we have a very different situation though, don't we? First of all, the speaker has receded and is just a small window or maybe non-existent. And what we've got is a giant screen where we project slides and then we've got the, the voice of the speaker. And so this is the situation we've got to contend with. And we've, we're, we're all doing this all day. We're seeing these things all day. And so a lot of us have the same experience, right? And so one thing we find is that if a slide stays up on the screen with no movement whatsoever for a long time while the person's speaking, um, it's, you're a little bit more likely after you skim the whole slide to maybe check your email or have another window open on, on your screen, right? Now, th there's nothing wrong with this slide. This slide is perfectly acceptable, um, especially because we tried to have, you know, relatively little on it, but there's also nothing moving. And so you can see when we show this content earlier, we showed each point at a time with a different image for each point. And it just kept things moving a little bit, a little bit more. And so one thing we try to do is to look for opportunities to keep things visually moving. You don't want to get distracting, but when there's an opportunity for it to move, we like to move. And so here's another example of a slide where we've got a, a fairly complex diagram that was made for uh, the speaker. And in this case, instead of just putting that whole diagram up and spending time talking about it with nothing moving, we can expose parts of the diagram to correspond with the, the, the uh, discussion going along with it. Right. Another cool but somewhat risky approach to create some movement is to move common objects across slides. And you may or may not be familiar with this, but in PowerPoint, there's an animation effect called Morph. In Keynote, which is a Mac program, there's a, a, an effect called Magic Move. And I'll show you an example of this, and, and you'll, you'll see later why I'm saying it's a risky one, but uh, it can be very effective. Um, I just pulled a couple slides from a series of, of slides in a presentation that was explaining the process by which a, a measure of a, a patient reported outcomes is developed. And part of that process involved taking products from one step and doing something with them in the next step, right? So I've got things being carried forward and transformed. I could just put separate slides there and that, that may be fine. Um, but, but it's a little easier for people to follow the story and makes it a bit more interesting if I can take some of those common, common objects and move them from slide to slide. In this case, I did that with that list of items, right? Another thing that we can do uh, when we're working with a virtual audience is to direct the audience's attention to parts of the slide. And, you know, when, when we're presenting, it's uh, a little easier to point or uh, do things like that. But if I've got a lot of stuff on the slide, one of the things I can do to keep things moving is to uh, visually indicate where I'd like people to look, what I'm talking about. And I could use graphical elements to do that. So two that I like to use are placing a highlighter colored box behind the element of interest. I'll show you in a second. The other thing you could do is just put a circle or a square around something um, of interest, right? So here's, here's a, a figure that has a few things going on. And I'm trying to explain different parts of this. And I like to draw attention to the parts that I'm explaining. And so one thing I can do is to take that little highlighter box and stick it behind the text that I'm explaining as, as I go through and I'm addressing each of those things. 
right? I can also draw a circle or a square around something to pick them out graphically. So that's something that's very effective. It keeps things visually moving along on the screen and it's helping to keep the audience in sync with the story I'm trying to tell. Another way that we might draw the attention of the audience to particular parts of a slide is to actually uh, make other parts of the slide de-emphasized. We can adjust the opacity or transparency to de-emphasize parts of a slide. And I've got a, an example from my colleague in population health sciences, Mark Reiser, who is an excellent presenter, by the way. And Mark's got this slide and, and Mark wished to bring attention to the end um, of, of this ductal outgrowth figure. And so his next slide looked like that, right? So he made the rest of the picture that he wanted people to not focus on more transparent. And he actually did that in PowerPoint here. He selected that picture. And if you go up to format picture under picture transparency, he made it 82% transparent. That's 82% see-through, right? So that's so so we have a number of different methods we can use to try to bring attention to different parts of the slides. Now I said that some of these are, are a little risky. More complex animations and transitions might not work on some platforms. Uh, WebEx is a little bit funky, right? If I'm gonna do a presentation on WebEx, I do not, I do not use Magic Move or, or fancier things like that. Um, I've, I've been hurt before, right? Um, so we always, always wanna test beforehand and be paranoid about testing. So even though we present on Zoom all the time, and Steve and I ran through a practice Zoom yesterday. We still got on a half hour early today and went through every single slide just to make sure it was working, that there wasn't some update that, that was gonna make it so that, it, that some effect didn't work. The other thing to be wary of is that complex builds and animations can be problematic if someone else is advancing your slides. And so depending upon the conference you're speaking at or the way things are set up, someone else might be advancing those. And that's gonna be a little bit tricky if you've got a lot of builds, uh, right? Cause you've either got to say um, next click, click, click and it gets annoying for everyone or you've got to practice like crazy. Um, now, Steve and I, when we usually do this talk and we trade back and forth, when we do it live, we both have our own remote controls so we can both control the slides. So one of the challenges for us uh, today was that I'm running this off my machine. And so I'm hitting all of Steve's builds. I've never had to do that before. Usually I could just tune out and go to my happy space while he talks, but <laughs> I've got to pay attention now and I'm likely to screw it up at some point before the talk is over with. But, so it takes a little bit more doing. But, but if you can manage those, those risks, there are some benefits for uh, moving things along, directing the audience's attention. Let's talk about font size here. And certainly we're in a situation when we're looking at a screen where the contrast is very, very good. Um, things, it's a much better situation for reading text and reading figures than projecting in some uh, miserable academic lecture hall. So let's look at this though and, and just get a, do a little experiential learning here. Um, and so, I've, I've listed some text here and the, the font point size is listed to the left, the 80, 60, 40, 30. And if you're uh, on a laptop or on a desktop on Zoom and Zoom is full screen, you might take it out of full screen for a second and resize that window. And you know, remember when Steve said that the, the, the worst case scenario we're, we're preparing for is a person looking at a small tablet, right? Well, resize your screen, your Zoom screen to the size of a, of a maybe a small iPad, right, or a Samsung, and have a look at how easy it is to read the text here. Um, now, if you're a fan of the greatest musician that ever walked the earth, it'll be easier for you to read the text because you know what this is saying. But have, have a look there. And, you know, when we look in different settings, <clears throat> it seems like a 60, 60 point font is a good default font size. You could go smaller and have it still be legible. 
But 60 really requires no effort whatsoever to process, even, even if it's being shown on a relatively small screen. So that's our, our advice is when you're making your slides, just have that in mind. 60 is, is my default. And if I need to make a little smaller, I can. Uh, maybe it's going to be something like a photo credit or something like that. I'm, I'm not as concerned that everybody is, it's, you know, that it's jumping out at everyone. But um, so that's our recommendation for that. Uh, now, special for you all, because it's the new year, a bonus tip, creating a presentation palette. Now, I just described a whole bunch of methods that we might use uh, to, to make the, the, the slide experience a little more interesting. But if you notice, they involve a lot of different graphical elements. And it's kind of a pain to make those things. It, it takes a long time to make those types of slides, right? So do yourself a favor and create a presentation, call it whatever you want, um, with oft used or cool graphical elements. You know, if you worked hard on a particular graphical element, save it in that file. Whenever you make slides, have that, have that PowerPoint or that keynote or whatever it is file open so you can copy and paste, right? It really will save you a lot of time finding or recreating those slide elements, right? So here's just a few from my, I probably have five pages on mine. These are all elements I use a lot. In the upper right's that highlight box, right? All you gotta do is copy, paste it, and resize it. Here's a, here's a white box. I've already put an animation effect on it. It's the disappear effect in Keynote. Why do I have that there? Well, you'll see a little bit later, but that saves me a lot of clicking around. You know, I don't have to say, make a box. Now change the fill of the box to white. Now go up to animation add the build out of disappear. That's a lot of clicks to do. All of that's already done for me. I just copy, paste, resize it and all as well. And, and uh, icons, the things that I tend to use again, they're right there. And it just saves me so much time when I'm making my presentations. It's much less painful to make interesting presentations. So quick review here for creating effective slides. Steve talked about that notion that every pixel counts so don't have stuff on the screen that's not contributing to the storytelling because it's just gonna use up cognitive resources of the audience. Try the best you can to keep things visually moving, right? Direct the audience's attention when you've got more stuff on the slide uh, than people might be able to attend to easily, let them know where we're, we're talking about, what we're, what we're talking about. Use large enough fonts maybe a default of 60 point, and save yourself some time by, by creating your own presentation palette. Let's talk a little about presenting data. And if you think about it, for most scientific presentations, this is really what everybody's at your talk for, right? Is to know what data you collected to address the research question of interest and, and what, what it told you about um, about the, the question you were trying to answer. And if, if you think about one of your research projects, right, you may have literally thousands of pages of kind of tables or figures or statistical output, right? And, and you know, distilling that down to one or two or three key data presentations to share with the audience to tell your story is is complex and it's non-trivial, right? And if you if you're not careful about um, about making those selections, you may end up showing your audience a picture like this, right? Just overwhelm them with data. And I think particularly for trainees, sometimes who are anxious about presenting, they they want to overwhelm the audience with their kind of maybe technical sophistication, and and you really are just overburdening them cognitively when you do that. And so we want to just talk about three key principles that we think are, are important for engaging your audience when you're doing, uh, when, you're, when you're displaying and presenting data. And the first is show them only what's necessary for the story that you're trying to tell. Don't include extraneous information. The second principle is that prepare people for what they will see, right? So set people up so that they're not 
you know, hit with a whole bunch of data at once and then, you know, start focusing on your, on your picture or your table and stop listening to you. And the third principle is that when you show them um, what you're going to show them, reveal the data in layers that support the story that you're telling. So make it digestible and understandable and don't overwhelm them with data displays. And, and we'd like to show you a few uh, examples. And so one of the most typical that we're all familiar with, right, is the table. And this is just a, a cut and paste from a manuscript, right? And the issue is that, um, you know, looking at a table in, uh, while you're sitting with coffee and reading a manuscript is a very different experience than um, experiencing a table in a 15 minute scientific presentation, right? And so, um, uh, you know, so what we want to uh, be careful of is when we present an overwhelming amount of information, we just kind of, what typically will happen, right, is the audience member will either dive into the table to try and understand what all this information is and why you're showing it to them, or they're going to look down to their phone and check their text messages because it's just too much information to process, right? And so, Another thing that people will do with the table sometimes is they will show the entire table and then they'll highlight the piece of information that they want you to focus on in the table, right? And the problem with this approach is that it violates Tufti's principle that we talked about earlier, right? Every pixel requires cognitive effort to process. And so we've really just got way too much information on the page, right? And so let's say, um, Let's say that th that this point, this survey question, the percent of patients who responded the doctor told me is really the focus of interest here. And it turns out that in this particular study, this number is much smaller than people would have expected, right? And so an alternative approach to show this would be to start with a blank page, right? And now let's prepare them for what they're gonna see. We're going to tell them a percentage of respondents that, that said the doctor told me. And then we just show them the number, the 16%, right? So this is a really simple display. By preparing them, it, it lets them know what you're gonna show them. It also creates a little bit of drama because you know that they may be surprised by the number that you're showing them, right? So this is a, a, an alternative way than showing an entire table. So a second example, right? that we can look at is kind of a default uh, kind of Excel-like table. Oftentimes we have data in Excel tables. It's really easy to move Excel tables into one of the templates in PowerPoint, right? These colorful templates. And we can see if we, if we focus back in on the table, we can see that like what this slide is trying to talk about is kind of financial toxicity. And it's looking at the financial burden uh, for insured cancer patients, right? The monthly breakdown of average monthly costs. And it's got a lot of categories here of different kinds of co-pays. And, and these data were actually collected by one of our uh, friends and colleagues, Dr. Yusuf Safar, who is an outstanding presenter. And what we'd like to do is show you how he um, presented this data at a national meeting. And he shared this with us so we could, we could share it with you. And so he starts out the slide with a picture of a patient because he wants to connect the numbers that he's showing the audience that it has a human cost and that it's connected to a, to a person. And instead of showing all the data at once, he uses builds. And what he does is you'll see there's a monthly total at the bottom. He's condensed some of the categories and then he builds and we have a running total at the bottom as we show these different things, and right, and so this is kind of a um, a much more kind of simple, uh, clear presentation that really keeps everything focused on kind of the impact of these costs on the patient. Right, and let's turn to another example, and and the point of this example is to illustrate displaying data that uh, are even more complex and also showing how to deal with a data display that comes at you um, uh, either from your statistician or you in this case take out of an article where 
you've got the whole figure right there. You didn't make the figure. And so you don't have control over each of the different elements of the figure. It just came to you, right? So let's say that I've got this article and I'm, and I want as part of my talk to show um, the data that are in panel A here, right? So I can uh, use some tool to capture that. And now if I just splashed this figure up on the screen and started talking, look at, look at all the information, the visual information that's there. And just like putting up that, that table from the manuscript, you know, people, People start trying to orient themselves and, and scanning everything, right? Um, and so that's that's a lot. And I would prefer that to not be the way people are going to be walking with me through these data, right? And so um, this is this figure just came to me, right? This is how it was in the in the the uh, the manuscript. And I like the figure because it shows me all the individual data points. So I don't want to make a different figure. I like this one. I just want to follow some of the principles that we outline to engage people, right? And the, the first one is going, the, the thing that I wanna do is to reveal this in layers. And so to do that, I'm gonna add white boxes to block out key parts, all right? Now, instead of going and remaking white boxes and adding animations like crazy, I just uh, hit two buttons, flush over to my other um, uh, presentation palette copy that white box, paste it, resize it, paste it again, resize it, and put it over all of the spots that I want to cover, and then set animations to remove sections of white boxes to reveal the figure in the order that supports my storytelling. And now I've already saved it in my presentation palette with the, with the disappear effect uh, already built in. And what I would do is to look at the animation orders and to make sure that each of those boxes are disappearing in the order that I want them to. But now look at how much better this is. If I came to my next slide and this is what was up on the screen, right? And I said, so let's start with a functional TP53 and we're gonna compare the percent of cell death between PKHB1 and atopicide. And what do we find? Well, the central tendencies are not particularly different here. There's some difference in variability, but we don't see much of a difference. What about for the dysfunctional TP53? What, what did we find there? Well, here was a much more marked difference between those two. Right? And so by, by just clicking through and removing these white boxes, I am walking people through the figure the way I'd like to. And note, it allowed me at the beginning to orient them to the axes, right? We're looking at cell death, percent of cell death. We're comparing PKHB1 and atopicide, right? Gets me oriented. It also creates a little bit of drama when I'm reminding them that this was a question of interest and what, what do the data say? And remember one of the principles Steve said is only show them what's necessary and you may, you may or may not recall that in the original figure, there was another piece along the top that showed the p-value for the test of the statistical interaction. For my particular presentation, I, didn't, I, didn't, I decided not to throw that in. I didn't need to do it. It was, for my purposes, it was graphically pretty obvious these were two very different situations here, right? So that's just another, another trick to use when you have more complex displays. But in all these examples, these three principles are, are illustrated, show them only what's necessary for the story, prepare people for what they'll see, right? Remind people about why we're looking at these data. What was the question? What, if any expectations did we have about what the data would look like? And then reveal the data in layers to support the storytelling. So now let's go to giving your presentation and um, we're gonna talk a little bit about preparation, speaking tips and handling questions. And this will be our last, our last of our four sections. And so let's start with preparation. And let's, let's look again at our situation. The situation is we don't really have much of a, a visual interaction between the speaker and the audience. It's mostly this huge visual component of the slides and the speaker's voice. 
Now, we've spent a good deal of time talking about how to make the visuals more engaging and supportive of the storytelling. We haven't spent much time on the sound. And so one thing that we'd like to suggest is if you're, if you're serious about doing good presentations virtually, invest in a decent microphone. And so we have our second of our two experiential learning exercises here. This is gonna be outstanding. We're gonna use Steve for this. And so uh, Steve, can you say something pithy in microphone A? You know, I, I really object that I'm always the guinea pig in our presentations. Okay. All right. Uh, I'm sorry. Now say uh, something uh, moving in microphone B. All right. But eventually I'll get revenge for that somehow, somewhere, sometime. <laughs> and microphone C. And this is microphone C. Uh, there you go. So um, now I'm listening on, on computer speakers here. Other people I know right now have headphones on and things. And maybe you detected some differences across those three. Let's, let's go back through them and find out what each of those were. This is like a bad game show from the 70s. So Steve, using microphone A, tell us what microphone A is. Microphone A is my Lenovo ThinkPad uh, uh X1 Extreme laptop, and that's the kind of microphone array, the default array microphone built into the laptop. And I will say that my experience as a listener is that you sound like you're coming through a mayonnaise jar at me, right? There, there is some, there's some distance created there. Uh, how about microphone B? What was microphone B said through microphone B? Microphone B is a Logitech, uh, I think C920 webcam, which is a really nice webcam, uh, provides a really nice picture. The, the audio is okay, but it's still, it's not, not the best. And so microphone C, what was that? Microphone C is a Samsung USB kind of desktop table mic. And in our experience, kind of a microphone like this gives the best quality without going to professional sound setup. And uh, yeah, and there are a number of, of manufacturers that make uh, mics like this. Samson is one, uh, Blue Yeti is another really popular microphone that people use for Zoom or podcasting. Well, I mean, what's really striking uh, to me is, and, and we, we actually, we didn't plan on doing this. We were working up the talk and modifying our original talk, we just thought, let's just try this out. And it's really striking how different a built-in microphone sounds relative to, um, I'm mean, forgetting, this is about 180 to $100 is the microphone that we're using. The, to my ear, there's a real immediacy to the sound. And, and that, that does, I think, contribute to, this, to the connection with the speaker. So Microphone C, I feel like Steve is my conscience. He's inside me. Uh, and microphone A is just sounds like I'm having to listen to someone giving a talk over the internet. Right. So, so that's one recommendation we've got uh, is to invest in a good microphone. Um, and uh, we've recommended a couple brands there, but it, it does really improve the quality of the presentation. Uh, unfortunately, um, everything is, is uh, at pandemic prices now. So there has been some, some price inflation. Uh, so, so try and find a good deal if you're gonna invest in one. Okay, um, so the, in, the next thing we wanna talk about in terms of preparation is to plan realistically for time. And, and remember way at, up at the beginning, we said that was, that was one of the two key questions to ask first, who's the audience? How much time do I have, right? And so we wanna make sure that, that, that we're still clear on that. Uh, you wanna communicate with the chairperson or the host to make sure that the expectations are clear. You wanna explicitly find out about expectations for time for questions. Um, some people say we need a 45 minute talk. And what that means is you talk for 45 minutes and then they have 15 minutes of questions. Some people say you've got a 45 minute talk and, and that's, 
any questions, you've, you've got to come out of that time. So we want to make sure uh, that that's discussed when questions are usually um, uh, dealt with. Okay. And lastly, uh, we want to note that if you are at a conference and you're on a panel in an oral session where you've got several speakers uh, moderated by someone, you know, if, if you were one of the later speakers in that time slot, be aware that that uh, we as academicians tend not to be the best moderators. And so, um, and we also like to talk too much. And so if you're one of the later speakers, you might find that, you know, you had 15 minutes, but the prior speakers have all been allowed to run over. And now it's come to you and you've got five minutes left or 10 minutes left. This, the, if, if you haven't done a lot of conferences, uh, just wait, this will happen to you. And when the end of that session comes, especially now that we're virtual, it's really easy for people to just hit end meeting, right? Or leave, the, leave that room. Um, so uh, to be paranoid, we like to look at our presentation ahead of time to know it well and to say, all right, what if I had to cut this down by a third? What if I had to cut it by half? Where would I do that? Which ones would I skip? What, what points would I skip? Which points would I condense a bit? Uh, it may only take you three minutes to figure that out, but your three minutes at your desk figuring that out is way, way better than being up on, on the virtual podium and getting increasingly ticked off and panicked now, right? So good to spend some time for that. Um, let's talk a little bit about knowing what to say when you're actually giving the presentation. Um, you'll have, you'll have uh, notes you've made in, in creating the presentation, but, uh, and you've got your slides, but now what do you do? You know, well, if it's a relatively short presentation, you can just memorize your talk, right? That's a realistic thing. You can memorize your talk. Another thing you could do is to print out your presenter notes, right? And so your, your PowerPoint or Keynote or whatever software will have a means for you to print out those presenter notes. Um, or you could have them just as PDFs in a separate window, right? Uh, but you want to keep yourself organized there. It's, it's tricky to be trying to do two things at once, advancing slides and advancing pages. You might also try to use the presenter mode on another device, right? So here's presenter mode in PowerPoint for, uh, for Mark Reiser's presentation. It's showing me the current slide the next slide and the, and the speaker notes on the bottom right there. And so that's presenter mode. And so I could try to use that while I'm doing my talk, but that gets a little bit tricky in terms of setup. And so we, we, don't, we don't recommend you do that unless you're very confident about how that setup works. Now, I'm actually using presenter mode. Um, I teach off of Zoom and I've got a setup I practiced a lot I'm very comfortable with where I'm sharing my iPad. And when I share my iPad and go into Keynote on show, show it from my iPad, the iPad's in presentation mode and uh, it treats the, the Zoom screen as an external monitor. So I've only got one, one button to, to hit there. Um, but, but what we're saying, I think at the end of the day is, you know, it's, it's a little tricky to figure out how you're going to keep track of your notes. So make sure you think about that and don't make any assumptions about the presentation situation you're in. Okay. Uh, Steve, I forgot. Am I doing this or are you doing this? No, you keep going. I hope people appreciate the irony that for the practice slide, we forgot what who's, <laughs> who's doing this one. <laughs> so, so one of the great things about uh, working virtually is that you, you could start a video meeting just with yourself and record your talk. You can record a Zoom of you doing your presentation. Then you can watch your talk and revise it. And when you've got that link for the recording, you could also send that along to your mentors and your uh, um, colleagues to have a look at that. And my screen just froze there, Steve. Yeah. Very I strange. Yeah. yeah. Um, we're missing all those, those nuanced pencil drawings I made of mentors and friends. It's too bad. So, 
but that so that's one bonus though of of being able to do virtual presentations is it's really easy to make a recording and see exactly how you're going to look and sound when you do this talk and to share it with other people, right? Another really important thing is to schedule a practice run on the video conferencing platform before your talk. Make sure you get that time. And if they don't offer that to you, ask for it, right? And so Steve's gonna say a little bit more about what, what you might do in that. Yeah, so a, a couple of, of points is, you know, it's important to determine who's going to control uh, slide advancement, in, you know, for your presentation, whether it's you or the host. And so I think um, that's definitely something you want to figure out. And um, in particular, if, um, if you are not going to be controlling your slide advancement, that really affects the use of builds like we've talked about for presentation. And so if somebody else is gonna control slide advancement, you most likely have to remove all like slide builds because it will not, it'll be really difficult to, to work that out. Um, uh, another um, issue is that you really do wanna confirm that all slide animations and transitions work the way that you think they're going to work as expected, like we talked about earlier. Um, and our last slide was a good example of that. That worked in practice and then it just failed in, <laughs> in, in actuality. But um, another point uh, is to determine a comfortable arrangement of windows, like where's the chat window, where are the participants, where are your speaking notes? And this, this seems to be a really huge problem. A lot of people end up when they uh, get on a Zoom and present, they end up in full screen mode where chat is not displayed and the participant window is not displayed. And so the chat is actually just a little bubble popping up at the bottom of the full screen and then disappears. And so um, kind of having some clarity on who's responsible for what and then trying to get a comfortable setup and hit escape and get out of full screen mode so you can get more things on your screen and be really comfortable with where the different aspects of your presentation are so that that doesn't become an impediment in kind of a good flow of your, of your presentation. Um, and uh, another point that, that is like, find out how questions will be shared. You know, who's gonna be monitoring chat? Are those gonna be taken during the presentation? Are they gonna come at the end? Um, and are they gonna, are people gonna be on uh, microphone to ask questions, or is it strictly going to be shit chat? So um, those things are all kind of key things to try and, and find out in advance, if possible. And, you know, one of the challenges, I think, with these points is that particularly now for national meetings, at least many of the national meetings I've attended, they're using custom presentation platforms. And so they're, they're, they're platforms that none of us are familiar with and trying to get these details and maybe get practice time on the platform, particularly if you're giving a synchronous presentation is, is kind of a key thing to kind of, um, you know, take a defensive posture against all the things that can go wrong when you're presenting. Okay. Uh, a, oh, you go no, ahead. I'll, I'll keep going. So, so in, you know, we can, entire workshops are given on the idea of, of speaking tips. And um, we just want to cover a couple that we think are important and uh, kind of relevant to bring up uh, very quickly. And the first uh, speaking tip is about pre-talk jitters being normal, right? That, that even experienced presenters uh, get these pre-talk jitters. And, you know, we, we like to to, to talk about this is this is your body's way of preparing you to give an energetic presentation. And that this is not something to get concerned about, but rather just harness this energy and it lets you know that your body is preparing you to give a very energetic talk. Uh, another point that um, we like to talk about is to rehearse a strong beginning. Uh, and that doesn't mean necessarily that you, you've memorized the entire talk, but this that moment when you start your presentation, knowing where you're going to start and what you're going to say is just something that can reduce some anxiety and get you off on the right foot in your presentation. Uh, another point is 
to breathe and be comfortable with pauses. We, many of us generally tend to talk a bit faster when we're presenting. And um, there's a, a, time, a time dilation effect that occurs that when we stop talking, like if we ask the audience questions, it feels like an eternity of silence that, that follows that point. And it's important to give people, sometimes, particularly when you're interacting with your audience, it, it gives people, it may take people a few moments to formulate a question in their mind. And in the virtual environment, after they've done that, they now have to find the unmute button and come on mic. And so, so it's, it's important to be comfortable with pauses if you are interacting with the audience. And also, if you take, if you take a moment and just take a deep breath, it gives everybody a chance to catch up with what you're saying sometimes if you've been going very quickly. Another thing that we like to talk about is, is to teach your talk. And the point here is that good teachers know that um, they should repeat key ideas. And sometimes you need to repeat key ideas in different ways to help different learners kind of really understand what you're saying. And particularly with scientific presentations, some of the ideas are very complex and it can be really helpful to repeat some of those ideas, particularly in the compressed time of most scientific talks, to kind of maybe repeat key ideas at a more abstract level or in a different way to make sure that your audience is staying with you throughout the presentation. Uh, my, my advisor, my PhD advisor used to tell me that I'm not supposed to lose the audience until the last five minutes of my talk. And for the first portion, everybody should be able to know what I'm saying and follow and understand. And then you zing them at the end with some ridiculous formula, right? Um, another thing is, to uh, keep track of time. We've talked a little bit about that. Um, the, um, the, you know, phones are good, but the screens always go blank. I actually prefer to have a physical timer somewhere on my desk in a virtual environment that, that shows so I can see what the elapsed time is. And uh, I think Kevin and I both agree that a cardinal sin in uh, the time of the pandemic is for a Zoom meeting to run over, right? And, and to, so it's really important to be respectful of people's times and, and keep on track. And so the last thing we wanted to spend some time talking about was handling questions. Um, and you know, when you're doing a scientific presentation, the questions are sometimes some of the most interesting uh, parts of the, of the whole experience. And you know, if you have done a good job of um, sort of making people think in a different way or to think about something they've not thought about before, it should generate some good discussion, uh, some discussion that, that um, requires a little bit of back and forth too. So, uh, but now we're in a virtual environment, there's a question about what to put on the screen during question and answer. Uh, should it just be your thank you slide or, or whatever? What, what should you do? Uh, we just like to suggest two things you might not have thought of doing. Um, when it's time for question and answer, one thing you could put on the screen is you. Stop sharing your screen and, and let people see you, right? Especially if they've got it in, uh, in, in speaker mode um, or speaker view, right? The other thing, especially if it's a longer talk that had, that had uh, several different pieces, is to throughout the talk, build a summary slide of the whole talk. So that when you're, when you're done with the, talk, with the talk, you've got this rep visual representation that makes everything familiar to people, right? And it helps to focus the discussion and this is from a this is from a, an hour long talk that I give. And as I go through each of these three main uh, three main things, I'm building these these graphics. So they're all familiar. And what I do at the end is just put them all up on the screen together. And it really does help focus the discussion. You can see when you when you're doing this live, you can see people looking at the screen and and thinking it does. It helps a lot. So you might give that a try. So in terms of actually handling the questions, a few quick tips here. Uh, if questions are posted in the chat box and, and you, you are not lucky enough to have a Jessica or Fiona, uh, make sure that you're reading or paraphrasing the question aloud that you're responding to. 
right? Because if especially if there are a bunch of questions, people may not know immediately what the question is. So you want to re read or, or paraphrase that. Um, you know, if you've if you're talking about something that's really making people think differently, it might be a little bit of a struggle, and it, and you know, people might be asking a question in a way that they're having trouble articulating what the question is, and you're having trouble understanding what they're saying, right? And it is absolutely okay to ask someone to rephrase the question, right? It's a sincere thing to do, to say, you know, I, I think I'm I'm 80% with you, but could you come at me in a, a different way with that? And be mindful that when you're giving a scientific talk and someone asks a question and all of the audience is sitting there saying, wait, what are they asking? Right? No one understands what they just asked, but you kind of BS your way through an answer. That's not cool because now, now you've let the entire audience know that you are comfortable kind of surfing on some shallow interpretation of what they've said rather than just saying, I, I think I'm mostly with you, but can, can, you, can you say that again? And in our experience, um, when you say that, there's a good deal of time when people will say, well, actually, maybe I'm not sure what I'm asking. I guess, I guess what I'm asking is this, and they end up saying something different, right? Because uh, it's hard. It's a conversation. So, um, And uh, it's also okay to say that you don't know. Um, again, you don't want to be up there making it look like you feel that you need to just roll with some answer for every question. Sometimes it's a, it's a question you don't know the answer to. And it's fair to say, you know, that's something we didn't look at. It's a great idea, though. I, I love to talk to you afterward about that. Um, and you will sometimes get a question that really is beyond the scope of the work that you're discussing. And you, you don't have to take up the meeting time giving an answer to everything. It's it's fine to say, you know, that that's an interesting issue. It wasn't something that we that, that I've addressed here, but I'd, I'd be happy to discuss, you know, by email with you and hear your thoughts about that. So there's just some quick tips about dealing with questions. And so as we step back and, and look over our whole time here, um, I think there are a few key messages, very simple messages. Choose and tell a good story for, the, for this audience at this time. Tell that story as simply as possible. Create visuals that engage and focus the audience and prepare yourself both psychologically and technologically for the talk you're gonna give. 